Welcome to the Value Investor TV podcast. This is a podcast that helps you grow your wealth and become financially independent. My name is Becco, and I have a very special guest today, Matthew Peterson. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Becco. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. It's nice so, to see you again. You know, Matthew and I connected uh, through a mutual friend. A shout out to Victor who connected us. Uh, he's mm-hmm. uh, also a, a, big, a um, big follower of the podcast and also a close friend of mine, as well as Hari. Um, so Matt, yeah, you know, you just, you just recently moved to, 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 uh, Texas along with, uh, a That's bunch right. of other people from California. You're originally from Los Angeles or you were in Los Angeles. You moved around a whole bunch from New York and, and other places, but most recently you were in mm-hmm. California, moved to Texas. And obviously Hari and I have connections in Texas. Uh, that's where I used to work. That's where Hari still lives. Uh, and so we got, we got connected through a, a local kind of value community down there in Texas. So really happy to have you in the podcast. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we did. Um, we did just move here. We moved here actually, it's been about a year. We moved in January of, of, uh, of 2020. And, uh, you know, I've, I've spent time in a lot of places, as you mentioned, New York, I was in London for a couple of years. I lived in Beijing for six months and LA when we launched the fund. Um, and each sort of, uh, place that we went had a, had a purpose. And, uh, we are just so happy with this move. We, you know, we got a little more space. We have a young family. Um, and so it's been, it's been a, a very nice, uh, transition for us. Yeah. We went the other way. So I came, you know, yeah. came to California two years ago and then <laughs> That's right. you, went, you went to Texas. So before we start be the back. podcast, <clears throat> before we start the podcast, I, um, I think it, it, it'd be, um, worthwhile to kind of give you a little, uh, give you guys a little bio, uh, background on, 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 on Matt. So, uh, Matt is the managing partner of Peterson Capital Management, LLC. He has been uh, working as a financial professional for two decades. His experience includes working with global financial services firms, including Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, American Express, and Ameriprise Financial. And so, you know, we're here to hear, you know, it's a real, it's a real uh, honor to have you here with, you know, with somebody who is really experienced in the investing world. Uh, with really hands-on experience uh, managing uh, other people's money and, and and really doing it in a doing it in a in a value sort of um, mindset. Uh, since you know we are ta- uh, you know we are uh, we are on Value Investor podcast, I, I think it's it, I think it's a it's a good coupling that um, you and I met and that we're able to to, to have a conversation here on on this podcast. So yeah, thank you. So why don't we get started? So. Um, I guess before we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, your fund um, and kind of the the orientation you take in the market? Sure, absolutely. I've been um, so I've been sort of uh, planning to have this fund in place for for really two decades or even longer, uh, and I spent a lot of time out on Wall Street and in London doing risk management work and a bunch of other work with uh, these investment banks. And uh, in two thousand and ten. I left New York and launched the fund. Fund actually launched in 2011 out in LA, and it's a long-term concentrated value fund. Uh, so we have uh, really a handful of really core compounding positions that we know extremely well, and uh, and we have some unique strategies on how we enter and exit our holdings as well. Yeah, so I think it'd be good to kind of dig into that. Um, um, in this episode, you know, why don't we kind of dig into your, your philosophy and what you look for in companies and kind of the process that you, that you uh, and the team, uh, has put together in, you know, sifting through, through, um, through uh, the universe of stocks to find, you know, one or two gems. What, what is your, what is your yeah, kind of, uh, checklist look like? Absolutely. Back up. So, um, so where to begin? Let's let's start. So there's a really simple framework that I use, um, and I and I and I think it, it's really relevant for folks to apply. We're we're basically looking for the very very best business models that are available, and we're looking for the highest quality management um, that's available, and we're trying to find um, extremely cheap prices. And if you can get a great business model with great management at a cheap price. Uh, you've got a lot of arrows pointed in the same direction, uh, and it's it's hard to go very wrong if you have that framework. And frankly, there are very few companies 
that you'll find that would fit into all three of those categories. Because as soon as you have great management and a great business model, you've got high valuation, you could even have a great uh, manager, you could have great management and a poor business model and even end up with high valuation. Uh, so it's it's really rare to find all three of those uh, at attractive, in a, you know, in combination. Yeah. That is a high level lens that we're searching for. Uh, what I've, if you want to talk about, pro, you want me to go through our process? Because our I think our process is pretty, uh, I've, I've, I've created a narrative where it sounds simple, but each one has a series of steps and, and factors. Um, yeah, ahead, why, don't we, why don't we walk through the, your process? I think it's really interesting, kind of the, the, the process you, you've, you've, you've created, which, mm -hmm. um, yeah, why don't, why don't you walk us through that? Uh, so to begin, I'll say uh, there's actually a line, I think, I think it was Peter Kaufman who said that, uh, you know, where there's mystery, there's margin. And, um, and I find that to hold true in so many aspects of life. And uh, so, you know, in the value investing community, it's, um, it's like you evolve or die. And I don't mean that, you know, every time is different or the cycle is new and different, but I think you need to keep on the treadmill and you're learning and you're evolving and you're adjusting for a changing environment. And if not, um, you become stale and the things that used to work don't work um, anymore. Uh, so, uh, you know, 20 years ago, if you were able to get a, a, a great computer and be in the right place, you could do massive filters and, and become this forensic accountant CPA. And of course you need to have, uh, you know, your, your financial capability. But, uh, I found a long, a lot of years ago that, um, filtering for companies is really an, in screening for companies is a really ineffective way to find true opportunities because everyone's doing it. There's zero mystery. You can get a high schooler, um, to go on, on, you know, Google finance and put in their favorite ratios and you get cash flows and EVD, EBITDAs and everything else. And it, and it spits out something. And if that's your starting point, I think you're competing with the wrong, you're, you're just almost in the wrong place. Uh, so we need to overcome that, but we needed a hack. Um, particularly I needed a hack, uh, back on wall street because I was still trying to manage my PA and, um, and I had no time to research the things that I wanted to be looking at. So I needed a hack. I found a, a academic article that was showing the alpha that was created just by copying Warren Buffett's 13 Fs, for example. And I thought, well, that's interesting. What if you just extrapolate this to a lot of fund managers mm -hmm. and look at uh, things through that lens? And so still today, uh, that's our starting point. And, um, and what that does, you know, Charlie Munger is always saying you need to fish where the fish are. This is where the fish are. So if you go and you're looking at Bill Ackman and Carl Icahn and Seth Klarman and, and David Einhorn and, you know, any, you can make your own list. They can't be high frequency traders. Okay. But you make a list of deep value fund managers that you admire and probably the re you recognize why they're good and what they're especially good at. Uh, and frankly, we have a list of about a hundred, uh, 13 Fs we review in our step one process and some proprietary spreadsheets that make it pretty easy uh, to filter these through these. And then we take a superset of those companies. And you would be, uh, I think most people would be surprised to see that among the, so imagine a, a $10 billion fund, if they have a cost rate portfolio and maybe 10 holdings, they have spent many hours uh, many, many months, likely, re maybe years, researching a firm, researching an industry. Uh, they have spent possibly millions on salaries and other expenses to try to uncover all of the details they can. And it has passed through all of their filters and, and they've allocated a billion dollars or some amount into that holding. That's a really nice, uh, really nice data point to have. And it's a really good starting point. So among these, say, 100 funds that we're looking at, when we create the superset of what is owned, it actually comes to about two or 300 firms. And then they don't change very often. So that's another interesting aspect. So if you actually make this a disciplined part of your approach, it's just a beautiful hack. 
because you're studying great companies, you're studying great management teams, uh, you're in the circles with all of these other uh, maybe super investors. And so you're learning, uh, you're learning the right things and you're seeing the right lessons. So in a way it compounds on itself. And this is our, this is the, the starting point. So skip the screening, pull up scc.gov and look at some 13 Fs and it'll mm-hmm. get you way further. And it's, and it's easy, frankly, it's easy mm-hmm. and it creates alpha. Uh, it's been proven academically to create alpha. Mm-hmm. The second step in our process then becomes deep fundamental analysis. So uh, this is where, you know, your your financial accounting comes in, your, your, your MBA, CFA training comes in, but it's trying to understand why, why is this in the portfolio, but really it's trying in their portfolio, but really it's trying to understand, you know, is this company cheap? What's the business model? Who's, who's, who are the managers? Uh, you know, our revenue is growing, where's margins going? Do they have moats? You know, really understanding, is this something? I mean, we run a concentrated portfolio. So is this something that would ever deserve a position? And um, a lot of it is coming from the assumption that nothing's going to come into the portfolio uh, and something really has to shine. Uh, but so basically we're throwing out ideas. And uh, and so that's the second that's the second process. That's the second step is just this deep fundamental analysis. And usually it narrows down, by the way, very quickly, Becca. So for any of your listeners that adopt this same process, because it's something that people can really do, when you pull up 200 companies and you've studied 80 of them previously, uh, you already know where they lie. And then you sort of look down at the remaining 120. And uh, in my situation, I really don't know biotech. And so it's really not something that's in my circle of competence. Uh, if there's something in biotech, you know, maybe someday I'll learn it more. But um, right now I, I sort of put in the two hard pile. Uh, and I, and I, cause there's so many others to look for. So you quickly get down to a couple dozen that grab your attention, stand out as being valuable, and you can start doing even deeper analysis. Uh, and that's all step two, uh, step three. So if it's really past these filters, uh, the, and I think this is a very unique thing for our fund. Uh, and I've been doing this for years. In fact, I wouldn't do it any other way anymore. I don't, it doesn't seem rational any other way, but, uh, we don't buy through the market or limit order. Like most retail investors are accustomed to, uh, we are always looking for the very best way to get access or exposure to the companies that we want to hold in the portfolio. So that might be, that might be a warrant or some strange, uh, position derivative that was offered for some strange reason at a historically or a different point in time could be some convertible bond or something that's available. Uh, but most commonly, uh, what we do is we look at the long dated, uh, leaps, the put contracts, and we're writing cash secured put contracts as a tool to enter the position. And so what happens is, um, in, you know, as a value investor, we're looking to pay as, as little as we possibly can for a great opportunity. And oftentimes when something becomes attractive, it's because there's been maybe an event of some kind that has driven down the price significantly. And at the same time, the volatility goes up. Uh, And if you know Black-Scholes, you know that a lot of these factors align when that sort of thing happens. And the premiums on puts and even calls, but we're focused on the puts, uh, go up. And uh, there's oftentimes a great amount of demand at that time because people are fearful and so the premiums are quite high and we are willing to, with a strong understanding of the quantitative and qualitative aspect of the business, we're very comfortable with our margin of safety and the price willing to pay. And we set that price and we say, hey, you know, eight months from now or two years from now, we are willing to pay X for, uh, for this security as long as you buy it from us today. And so if there's a security that sells for hundred dollars and maybe it came down from 150 and we think it's worth 200 and now we're going to buy into it instead of buying it for a hundred we'll write a contract tell it to someone say hey, you pay us twenty dollars and over the next year uh, we'll buy your contract at any point for a hundred bucks and uh, so they pay us 20 we hold on to our 80 and uh, and 
if the contract expires and the price is above the strike, the price of stock is above the strike, uh, it expires and we've earned 20 on 80. So we make 25%. Didn't even own the stock. That's a fine scenario. Uh, alternatively, if the price declines a bit and that's our preference. So, uh, you know, something happened, it falls a little more and uh, now it's trading at in the 90s or something. The shares are put to us at the end of the year for 100. Our net cash outflow is 80. And, um, you know, instead of, let's fast forward then a decade, because this is just our entry method. But you go a decade out and let's say hypothetically the shares are trading for 800. Okay, I'm making up the numbers, but uh, they're trading for 800. If we buy it in the traditional way, we make 8x or 800%. We buy it in our method. Now we've made 10x, 1,000%. Uh, and then we invert that, you know, and we sell a covered call as our exit method. So as it approaches 800, maybe that's our exit. We'd sell, write a call, uh, and maybe get paid a hundred bucks. So we're actually out at 900. Yeah. Uh, so instead of going from 100 to 800, we go from 80 to 900. Mm. And, uh, that adds a tremendous amount of, uh, just cushion and alpha over time. Uh, to the portfolio. That's sort of the third step is to figure out how we're going to get the exposure in the most efficient, and effective way possible and pay the cheapest price. And then the final uh, step that I think is critical is understanding um, true capital allocation strategies. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, uh, we run a very concentrated portfolio and that portfolio makeup is um, very deliberate. Uh, I spoke in Switzerland a couple years ago about um, diversification versus diversification um, was the title of my talk. And it was um, all about, I inverted the Kelly criterion, which is often used um, for sort of blackjack and a few other, uh, originally John Kelly invented it to put, uh, transmit uh, uh, sound through telephone wires in the 1940s. And he did all his math with punch cards. Um, I inverted it with Excel, it took me an afternoon uh, and I said, you know, if if this works in a very objective situation, but financial allocation is very subjective by nature, what if we could just solve for every variable? And when I solved for every variable and then took very extreme parameters, I realized that the optimal portfolio allocation is between two and 10 positions. And that optimizes growth. It doesn't optimize volatility. So we actually accept volatility uh, as a means to being on a steeper path. Uh, so, so, um, we apply the Kelly criterion to our, uh, to our capital allocation strategies. We end up with a very concentrated portfolio, a few core, um, long-term compounders within it. And, um, and that is essentially our, our process. I may sound really simple, yeah. but uh, you know, that's, that's the process. Yeah. Let me, if I could just quickly summarize this, and this is super fascinating stuff. And I, you know, I've heard about your approach before, but you know, thank you for walking me through that. You know, three-step process. I feel like step one and step three. Step two, obviously, doing due diligence on the company, doing really a deep dive in the company is something that every individuals and fund managers obviously have to do, should do. But the step one and step three are really interesting. Your starting point and your entry point into the market. Super, super unique value proposition, if you will. Uh, you know, in the in the world of of a fund manager, I, I feel. So just to recap, really quick. Step one. You're looking at F13s to uh, basically find to find a fertile ground to start. Right, this is a universe That's of right. stocks that are already sort of approved, if you will, uh, have been passed through the filters by the the greats in the industry. So you, you're sort of uh, starting at a good position. And then two, and Beko, obviously, I doing don't the want deep to interrupt, dive. but I'm going to interrupt for one moment to sure, say sure. to add. Step one doesn't necessarily lead you to the finish line. That's the starting point. What happens is you find out that the same management teams uh, are involved in a couple of companies that made it to through that filter. And then you go and you look at what else they manage and you f discover they manage a third company that's not on your 13F list. And maybe that becomes the area of interest. So this is a starting point and then you follow the breadcrumbs mm -hmm. and it leads you into all sorts of interesting places. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, really, really interesting, interesting um, kind of entry point, as you mentioned, as a, just as, as a simple starting point. Obviously, a ton of due diligence that you have to do following that, which is step two. But step three, which is really interesting point. I mean, you are value investor to the core. I mean, you, you are not leaving any money on the table. Like in any, <laughs> every way possible, you are doing what you can do for your LPs to get the best deal possible, all the way from finding the best companies, but also entering the position. You're using options to get into the market, to, to go into That's the market right. and also get out of the market on both ends, put, puts and calls, which I find really fascinating. Um, you know, I've never heard your approach ever uh, done anywhere else. I, I feel like it's a, such a unique value proposition. Um, yeah, so thank you for Marco, I that. used to be very reluctant to share it publicly, actually. So mm. when I recognized that it worked, the first thing I did was I brought it um, internally. I was at, at um, consulting for Goldman at the time. I brought it to some MDs and I said, we should have a trading desk that's doing this. And um, this is part of the reason it works, by the way. Uh, we then did a little and I did a little analysis for them. And I said, OK, they said, how big is this market? And we thought maybe it's 500 million or a billion, um, depending on how many positions you get into. If you want to have a, if you want to do it on everything, it gets much larger. Uh, and you know, they very quickly said, "Okay, well, we're not going to do it then. Uh, the market's just not big enough for yeah. Uh, yeah. big investment banks." Sure. And um, and so that leaves actually some money on the table for uh, for funds to go out and mm -hmm. do this sort of thing. So I was very reluctant to share this publicly for many years after I launched the fund. What I realized over time is that even in sharing it, there are very few people who have the discipline uh, or the, the capability to copy it exactly. And if any of your viewers wanna go and use it, it's just too big of a space. I mean, there we, we won't even, if we find each other, we'll embrace. It's like a celebration when I meet someone else that understands how to do this. So um, I've, I've loosened up a little bit on the tight lips and uh and so hopefully you know some of your some of your viewers and listeners can make some money yeah it's, it certainly seems like a secret sauce that you've developed i mean do you you also said this is something that not a lot of retail investors have access to is it something that retail investors can do uh it is but the bigger challenge for many retail investors uh is that every option represents 100 shares and so uh as a very simple example uh Berkshire Hathaway has their B shares, I guess around today, they're selling for like $220 a share, let's say. Uh, during the crisis, actually, it, it becomes quite remarkable if you ever follow this. The premiums get so high on such quality companies because Black Shoals is all quantitative. So if the market falls and Berkshire falls, it's just looking at volatility, the underlier price, time horizons, and these things are not about the business. Mm. So if you understand the business, uh, you'll get, you will still find huge spikes in the premium. So we were able to pick up a 25% IRR selling a six month put on Berkshire Hathaway wow. uh, in, in April, which is just, it's just totally ridiculous. So it was selling for basically book value. And then somebody's willing to, to just hand us over their money. Um, it basically allowed us to drop the price, I think from one 60 something to 147. That's amazing. Uh, I think it was 165 with the contracts and they paid us $18. So we were in at 147. Wow. Just ridiculous. Um, and so the challenge is that each one is 100 shares. So to go and commit to buy uh, 170 and now you're doing that 100 times, now that's 17 grand and you did one. Yeah. All right. Uh, if you're, if you as an individual are going to have a diversified portfolio, uh, which, you know, I do recommend a little bit of diversification and, and, um, but you don't need probably nearly as much as almost everyone listening has. Uh, but you know, if you want 10 positions, uh, now you need to have 200 K sitting in your brokerage account, uh, to make that happen. And so it automatically get eliminates right. a whole lot of, a whole lot of people. Yeah. Uh, now if you have a couple million laying around, yeah, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, this and is and you should do it. I love to. Yeah, kinda... so I don't. And and, and Becco, I'll tell you. You know, people always ask these kind of questions, um, but I'll just tell you. Like, I literally don't buy stock in any other way, <laughs> unless there's a better, unique product available, like wow. a tarp warrant that was created. Like, there's no reason I would buy with a limit order uh, when I could just sell 
a put contract, get paid and then get in for below the market price. So wow. it's not something that I just do in the fund. I mean, it's, it, this is just something I, I, I just wouldn't do it any other way. It doesn't yeah. make sense to me to buy yeah. any other way anymore. And I think, I think what's important here is also, I mean, the fact that you, you enter the market this way is very novel and very interesting from, you know, from LP standpoint, but also the fact that the reason why you can do this is because you've done step one and two you know the real value of the company mm -hmm. like you know you understand the true value of the company based on the business and you're just taking you just take advantage of the the mr market if you will that's right so uh that's exactly right and and beyond that i would add there's only there's really a binomial outcome uh so once you've done step one and two uh you're either going to buy the shares for the price you've committed or you're not going to buy the shares but in both scenarios you keep the premium Mm -hmm. So as long as you're getting a premium and my rule of thumb is I need to get at least double digits mm -hmm. IRRs on the premium. Otherwise, it's not worth it. So if mm -hmm. the volatility is shrunk to nothing, there are certain positions where it's not worth um, using these. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, you're either going to have it or you're not. And in either case, you're either going to get the shares that you want to own mm -hmm. or you're going to get a double digit IRR. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm happy in both scenarios. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's really where you want to be mm -hmm. when you when you start doing this. Mm -hmm. And it's also very dangerous. So if you're doing it the first time, don't you know, do one, go slow, watch it, learn from it. Um, I wouldn't recommend going in quickly. Yeah, it's, it's there's a lot of um, it's it's a it's an advanced uh, method. In fact, most people use these to protect their portfolio. Mm -hmm. We've just flipped it around and created, you know, we're selling insurance to mm -hmm. somebody who has the portfolio. They're buying it from us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super fascinating. I did. I did remember just as we were talking, I, I did remember um, Phil Town talking about his, his call options as a, as, mm -hmm. as a way to kind of juice his return as he as he exits uh, sort of long call options. Um, so it sort of harkens back to to that. I, I do want to mm -hmm. kind of shift topics here a little bit, Matthew. Sure. And address this kind of elephant in the room, because I think a lot of um, investors look at value investor, value investing as, as, oh, this is a relic of the past. How do you, how do you think about that? Well, I don't think it's a relic of the past, um, but I do think that value investors need to evolve. I think that uh, the very nature of um, value investing is sort of uh, it, it's it's based in sort of accounting and understanding uh, the financials of of a business. But and a lot of people look back to Benjamin Graham and to Warren Buffett and all these folks. But if you really look at what they did, uh, because we, we I think the whole community value investing community uh, sort of looks at at these icons and they see, oh, well, they own Coca-Cola or they own Geico. And they think that's the value investing companies that they should be looking at. But when they were looking at those companies, they didn't look like they look today. So they were actually looking through the windshield, not the rear view mirror at the time. But now, you know, in hindsight, it looks obvious to everybody. So, so a lot of the value community, uh, and myself included, I'm trying to evolve uh, a bit. But we spend time staring at the numbers, looking. You know, we need to have our, uh, you know, whatever discount to book value, and we need to have certain EV to EBITDA ratios. And we, you know, we're looking for the accountants in us, the introverts that just want to rip through these annual reports. Uh, forget that there's an underlying business. I, I mean, it's very important to recognize that there's a business, the business is competition with other business. So there's a whole ecosystem, including the shareholders and the regulators and everything else. And uh, so it's very important to be looking through the windshield. And I, uh, I recognize some of the greatest companies now uh, don't have a lot of book value. Uh, you don't need a factory to make cash flow anymore. Uh, you can do everything digitally. So if you're going to be a SaaS business, why am I looking at book value? doesn't make any sense, actually. Um, but it's hard to evolve from that if you've been looking at book value for decades and decades and decades. Um, I, think that, I think that Warren Buffett does a very good job of evolving. I think that he's evolved um, partly because he doesn't have 
LPs or partners. So he's allowed to evolve and, and change on a dime. Um, and I think that uh, it's a it's but a value is not dead. I mean, of course, uh, there are pockets that are have bubbles. OK, so um, and luckily, if you have a concentrated portfolio, you can just ignore some of those. So what's an example? Well, uh, Elon Musk is a really great operator. He's exceptional. Um, the auto industry for Tesla is like not the greatest industry and uh, his numbers show it. I don't know if, you know, maybe it's something else. Is it an energy company? I don't know what it is, right? Uh, but it seems really high. So we just get to, we just don't participate and that's it. I'm not gonna be short anything like that. Um, we, don't, we don't short anyway, uh, but uh, I don't, I think it's a mistake to just immediately write everything off. So value will, value will persist value is um value is always around over the long term uh it matters how much a company makes and that's what value is it's discounted future cash flows of a business mm -hmm. it's just that uh the business models are shifting and so you need to understand and, and evolve with the changing uh economy mm -hmm. yeah it's a great take um there's you know so much more so much more um topics that i want to talk about you know especially with like the the recent frenzies in the market with gamestop and whatnot but we are approaching mm -hmm. very rapidly end of uh, part one but i'd love to pick up the the conversation about your take on the market uh just commentary overall on uh yeah on the market uh um as a continuation of this thread of conversation here about value investing being dead and, and whatnot so um so I'd like to kind of end the podcast here and then pick it up in the second episode. Uh, how can people uh, okay. re reach out to you? Sure. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find. PetersonFunds.com is the website. That's the easiest place to start. We have a nice uh, YouTube channel now. Uh, our YouTube channel was recently set up by, by our intern, and he's done a terrific job. Uh, and... Um, uh, you know, folks can email me, but all that information is on the website. So petersonfunds.com is a great place to start. And, uh, and you can definitely reach out to me from there. Awesome. Thanks for the conversation, Matthew. I'll talk to you in the next Thank episode. Thank you, Becca. Thanks, guys. Great.